Hey there friends, Dave Plett is Canadian Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. And you're looking at our next documentary due out December 12th, 2022, Missing 411, The UFO Connection. It is going to be huge. And uh, it'll be, you can buy it from us at effective December 12th, or actually you know, we're going to pre-sell it November 15th. But it's going to be also available uh, online at all the major outlets and it's going to bring a lot of things into perspective for you trust me this is bigfoot 101 class number five we've made it to five and the amount of views we've had on the first four are pretty pretty impressive even to me i i can't believe that many people are interested in the topic and uh thank you for being here number one I'm not an expert on Bigfoot, Sasquatch, but I want to meet an expert once you find one, because there are none. Nobody can tell you definitively what it is. They all think it is. And people who say they're an expert on something, they better have some pretty hefty credentials in my book. And I haven't met many of those in the Bigfoot world. I've met many people that are very strong and very wrong. I met some people that I doubt that they have a sixth grade education, but boy, they're going to they're gonna tell you how wrong you are. Now, in writing books, one of the things you have to remember is that that book is going to be here forever, essentially. People are going to go back and read it and say, he didn't do this, he didn't do that. And you will show in the reviews on Amazon how good or how bad a book is going to be after a couple years. The When I started to do the Hoopa Project and Tribal Bigfoot, one of the things that uh, I told myself from the beginning is I was going to follow John Green's example and use affidavits to take witness statements. There was one researcher in California that he had one mission in life, just one. He never could think of using affidavits himself. He never went out and tried to find Bigfoot witnesses. He never thought of using a forensic artist to do Bigfoot drawings. But he decided he's going to go out and he's going to prove to the world that I lied and I didn't take any affidavits. That's all this guy wanted to prove. Well, he went out and he interviewed the witnesses I quoted, and they all said, yeah, I signed an affidavit to it. Uh oh, <laughs> uh oh. So then he just takes another angle at trying to defame me. That's kind of the people in the Bigfoot world. And before you jump into any world, understand what you're getting into. And I knew just from the readings I was doing that something was amiss. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of parallels between the UFO world and the Bigfoot world. And I knew that, UFOs and Bigfoot. But they might be related some way, I've heard. So we'll, we'll get into that later. Now, one of the things I, I hope you've gathered to this point is wild men, which is the going phrase right now for a big hairy biped that's wild, been talked about on almost every continent. Apes and gorillas? No, not on every continent. Wild men have been seen in all types of weather. Apes, gorillas? No, tropical environment. Good friend of mine, really good friend, and a great author, Rob Alley wrote this book called Rain Coast Sasquatch. And what he did is Rob has a really cool ability to get along with everyone. And he distinctly uh, honors and respects the First Nations and Native American people. And he went out and he got their opinion about what Bigfoot was. And each each tribe had their own sort of belief system. 
But one thing that was consistent in all of their talks and sightings is it was in the water a lot. It was around water a lot. So apes and gorillas, you might find one or two that swims, but they generally won't swim. Bigfoot swims. So some of the names that we've covered so far, Oma, O-H-M-A-H, Wild Men, Indian Devil, Kushtika, Stick Devils, Stick Indians. Now, in the book here, Rob talks about Kushtika, and he explains that in the Native American lore, it's somebody who died near or had a near drowning, and they were transformed into river otter people. And they grow hair, and they live in and around the water. Kushtika. So, to me, this book meant a lot because much of what the Native Americans talk about is what I've heard about before in Native, other Native American areas that I personally have gone to. And Rob solidified that Bigfoot swims really well. Important. Now what I want to do is I want to go back and start reading with you some articles and take you up until the end of Bigfoot, Wild Men, and Giants. So, first article. This one's called, Imbecile Held Prisoner in Small Room for Many Years. Newcastle News, Pennsylvania, May 28, 1909. Almost naked, confined in a little squalid, filthy room where it is alleged that he had been kept prisoner for 12 to 16 years, a strange creature half man, half beast, and devoid of reason was discovered yesterday by Constable William Hallis in South Sharon at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Matthews, who reside on the edge of Wheatland, says the Sharon Herald. That the wild being is a son of the woman by a former marriage is the allegation of the authorities who today are conducting an investigation into the startling and almost unbelievable case of squalor and neglect. For months, people who have passed the Matthews house have heard strange cries. They were never able to locate the source of the sounds, and it was not until word was brought to Constable Hallis that an investigation followed. Last night in the company of Herbert Reardon, the police visited the place. Mrs. Matthews at first refused them admission, but they presented a search warrant, and the woman finally allowed them to enter. Making their way to a little room in the upper story of the house, they forced the door, which was locked, and were confronted with a noisome and nauseating spectacle. Cowering in a corner of a straw-covered squalid room was a strange half-naked creature, so vile and filthy the words are inadequate to describe him. The few shreds of clothing revealed a hairy creature with resemblance to a human being, no dirty and wretched in appearance, with the officer and the companion instinctively shrank back in alarm. The creature alarmed at the Invasion offered no violence, but shrank back into a corner, corner and mutters incoherently. The room looked as though it had never been cleaned. There was no bed, and the dirty straw on the floor evidently afforded the unfortunate a place to sleep. Filth lined the floor and the walls, and the stench was terrible. The windows were boarded tight, and there was little or no ventilation or light in the wretched place. To all appearances, he had been kept alone, confined there for many years. The body was covered with long growth of hair like an animal, long bushy eyebrows at least two inches in length, and a beard that extended below the waist. The woman and her husband offered but little explanation regarding the confinement of the man, but it was learned by questioning that he is the son of the woman by a former marriage. That is, he is, it uh, looks like, I don't know what it says, years of age and the belief of the authorities and the comments made by the neighbors that has said that he has been kept a prisoner thus for many years. The victim is said to have escaped from the house about three years ago at night, but was recaptured and returned to the house before anyone knew. Physicians who examined the prisoner this afternoon say that he is a demented but harmless and that with proper care and attention, he would today be in fairly good shape. 
It is feared, however, that the long years of confinement and neglect have totally destroyed the reason he'll be sent to an asylum. So it was May 28, 1909. A lot of things about that story that uh, when I read it, I didn't think it was really a human. And you talk about the stories of Bigfoot mating with a human female. Obviously, if that happened and you were a woman, you would never want to admit that. So you would say, oh, it was just a, from a prior marriage, a prior lover. I don't know what happened here, but it was strange. Next story, August 1910. Is it or is it not the real wild man romping around New Burlington? New Burlington, Vermont, a very strange city. A real sure enough wild man has been discovered in a South Burlington blueberry swamp. At least so it is alleged. A man with that vicinity blew into Burlington yesterday and sat on a bench in City Hall Park where incidentally he met a free press reporter and told a weird tale about a man of enormous size covered with bristling red hair who had been seen several times in a swamp near South Burlington. Remember what I always told you, they're around and they're near water a lot. The wild man, if that's what it is, was first seen by a little girl who was picking berries. She had a large bucket and a small one, and the former serving as a sort of base of operations. When she filled the small pail, she went to a big one and emptied the contents. After several trips, she noticed that the big pail did not seem to be filling up as it should have been, so she concealed herself in the bushes and watched. After a few moments, a man of enormous stature, almost entirely covered with red hair and clad only in a gunny sack, appeared and after glancing about, began to eat the berries by hand. The little girl was frightened. It's needless to say, and after the creature had eaten her berries, she took the pail and ran home. But there are other evidences of the wild man's existence. Sheep have been found in several pastures in the neighborhood of South Burlington, horribly mangled, and the good housewives of that suburb have been missing canned fruit and other goodies which could be abstracted through a pantry window. There are a lot of shotguns loaded in South Burlington, and it's safe to say that if the wild man makes his appearance in daylight near human habitation, he'll have a good-sized charge of lead injected into his system. So, you wouldn't want to be loitering around Burlington in August 1910. This one is uh, the Evening Herald, Albuquerque, New Mexico, February 1913. Gallup, New, Mex New Mexico. A vicious, grotesque, and hideous-looking wild man was killed in the hills back of Navajo Mine last Saturday morning by a young Indian boy. The object, beast, or man, whichever it may be termed, had been menacing the natives in their daily work for the past five months. The man was entirely without clothing, his entire body being covered with a coat of thick, coarse hair, four inches long. The only part of him which was normal human was his feet, which would perhaps have required a number 10 or 11 shoe. The face was chinless, and only one lip was visible. The forehead sloped directly backward toward the head, something after the fashion of a pin-headed cannibal. Small bead-like pin's eyes were concealed, set deep in the sockets behind long and grimy eyelashes. The arms of the man were four feet long, and sharp, cat-like claws adorned the end. The man measured a full seven feet in height. For five months, the natives had been telling of this menacing object, which had been seen by, the, by hundreds prowling around the rocks both day and night, and it would always make a rapid escape over the rocks and disappear into a certain canyon. Traveling with great speed, a young Indian boy was traveling across the country with a Winchester and evidently must have cut the monster off from his retreat. He came straight toward the boy who raised the rifle and fired 12 shots at his body, eight, eight of which took effect, but only one of which had any serious damage. The body was taken to the, into camp at Navajo and company physician prepared a glass coffin in which the body will be preserved in alcohol. The Gallup Independent, after telling this tale, explains it as follows. D.T. Brown, an itinerant photographer from Albuquerque, brought the story back from a trip 
to the mines last Sunday. Well, whatever happened to that? Whatever happened to all these bodies? February 23rd, 1913. Let's pass on that one. Yeah, this is better. This is the one I marked. Tampa Bay Times, Tampa, Florida, May March 22nd, 1913. Santee turns up a real wild man. Giant Black lived in Carolina Swamp. Captured after a fight and is chained up to keep him within bounds. The thrilling story of the capture of a typical wild man of the jungle, a Negro covered from head to foot with black bristling hair, as thick and long as that on some giant gorilla on the edge of the Santee Swamp, South Carolina, near Lane's Junction, 50 miles north of Charleston, is told by W.S. Dammon, conductor of charge of the Atlantic Coastline Power Train, which arrived at 325 from Florence on Monday, says the Savannah Morning News. The wild man, Mr. Damon states, driven from Santee Swamp by a fresh het on the Santee River, hid in the barn near the edge of the marsh, and when discovered, fought fiendishly until overpowered and cowered in subjection. The man is now chained and tied to the ropes in the barn in which he was captured. Details of the capture of the man, Mr. Damon states, are unknown to him. According to Mr. Damon, when members of the family of Negroes residing on a small farm on the edge of the Santee Swamp went out to ramshackle barn in the rear of their little cabin about daybreak yesterday, they were frightened by the terrible sight of the man over six feet tall, broad and muscular, with great brawny arms and heavy shoulders, covered from head to foot with thick black hair, and whose eyes gleam like those of some wild animal, crouched in one corner of the shack, as though ready to spring upon the first living creature which molested him. The family of Negroes was said to were thrown into a panic and sent hurrying in all directions in search of aid. Residents of the neighborhood went to respond in this frightful cries and pleas for help. A small mob, it is said, formed around the barn within a half an hour, and plans were hastily made for the capture of the man, if possible and with little injury to him as necessary. The Negro showed the signs of fight, and when the effort was to catch him, fought viciously. Finally, however, without any of the mob being hurt, and without inflicting any injuries upon the man further than a few bruises of a minor nature, the burly stranger, more animal in appearance than human, was overpowered and tied hand and foot. Quickly, the news of the fight with the captured the man spread over the surrounding country and adjoining settlements. Lane's Junction began to pour into a little town to view the strange species of a human held in the barn of the Negro family. Little glimpses and circles of people, of blacks and whites to themselves, began to form all over the streets of Lane's Junction with here and there in a larger gathering of a white man with a few awestricken Negroes on the outskirts who would listen for a few moments to the, attend the discussion and then go back to those who they don't, blah, blah, blah. The Negroes said will not talk, glowering in a ferocious, sullen manner at his questioners at times and at others appearing wholly oblivious to their questions being responded. When anyone goes near the man, he strains and tears at his tethers and makes a throaty, horrible sound like the growl of some terrible man-eating beast than of a human. What is this? What are they talking about? The Washington Times, Washington, D.C. Lair of wild man is found in cave. <coughs> Strange hairy creature gives quartet of fishermen the scare of their lives. The Leaperville wild man today bids fair to rank with the far-famed but mythical Jersey Devil. Possess of brave men are drumming the woods for their strange hairy creature, which is reported to walk on all fours, repeating blood-chilling cries of ooh, ooh, and mag, mag. But the proposed lair of the savage man, a foreboding rocky nook, spotted with bushes and tangled with briars on Crumb Creek midway between Liperville and Avondale is being given a wide berth by the timid. In Ridley Park, it is believed that the wild man is a patient and escaped from the institution last spring after having been struck in the head with 
a lumberjack, or by a blackjack. News that a hairy creature of terrifying means was at large was told by the quartet of Earp, Fisherman, Duffy, Wiley, and Dillon. The encounter with the wild man occurred on the banks of the creek near Avondale, say the anglers. So he suddenly appeared strange creature with wild, hairy, and nude approaching in all fours. The quartet became stiff with fright. Wiley fell into a creek and swam to the other bank. There was other fishermen. Mag, 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 snarled the wild man, shaking his head. How the wild man terrified those who attempted to invade its cover is bothersome. The wild man is supposed to be in a cave above the Baldwin Locomotive Works, said the Baron. When the fisherman came back yesterday, she told the followers that the pool room was seeing it. There was a posse organized to get it. They would have captured it, all right, but something struck its hairy head out of the cave, and all the brave heroes fell in the creek. Of course, it would have been gone back into the cave and dragged the wild man out, but it wasn't a flashlight affair. It was more of a doubtful about groping around in the dark. So, you know that's what they're calling this. Monster would have been a word if it would have been a monster, but it's a wild man. It's continuous. It's... This one, real wild man found in cave, found by officials in southwestern Colorado clad in skins. And that this one caught my mind because you don't hear a ton of sightings involving them clothed. Has Colorado unearthed a counterpart of the famous wild man of Borneo? That is the question rustling around South La Plata County in southwestern Colorado. The wild man of Borneo was no more ferocious looking than the wild-eyed starting caveman that is brandishing this county jail here, according to the Sheriff Alexander, who with the aid of two deputies captured the gorilla-like human in a cave in Animus Canyon, north of this city. Tall and gaunt with long, uncupped hair, struggling from beneath a ragged cap, matted whiskers, his hairy body draped over skins of wild animals, with stripes cut from the height of the mountain bear encasing his feet, the strange man was trapped in a located mountain cave by the county officers brought here for an investigation. The, cap the aroma of the wild man exuded from his body when he was captured, the officers said. The, capture, the captive is believed insane, but long has been hibernating in the mountains is a mystery. During lucid moments, the weird stranger says that he has been roaming the hills in the San Juan country for years and that he first sought solitude in the canyons. A faded picture of a young woman and strands of golden hair found in the wild man led authorities to believe his condition is to do to an unfortunate love affair. Oh boy. A love affair makes you grow hair all over your body four inches long. Efforts to learn the names have been unsuccessful. Fantastic stories of the presence of the wild man in the nearby hills became current in the village of Rockwood, where several weeks it was said that the wild man had been sinking through the timber in the Durango National Forest. The officers encountered great difficulty in reaching the cave as the entrance was at the top of an almost perpendicular path, and they were forced carefully to pick their way narrow ledges. When trapped, the man offered no resistance. No weapons of any kind. Assistant prosecuting attorney of Durango has had several interviews with the wild man and is confined in the insane ward at the county jail. Oryx says the prisoner is never violent but frequently grunts and growls like some wild animal. There's a lot of women that say that their husband responds like that after dinner. At other times when he appears, I'm just kidding, when he appears rational, he talks glibly about a nomad's existence, telling of having a fought wild beast in the mountains, some of which he killed for food, of being shot by hunters who mistook him for an animal, of lying in lonely canyons 
when his only food was rats and chipmunks. The wild man, according as prosecutor O'Rourke, has told a harrowing tale of suffering from the exposure and, and when mortification set in, he pulled the decaying toes from their sockets. Occasionally, when he suffered excruciating pain and hunger, the wanderer licked mountain rocks to obtain a taste of salt. Wow. That's a big one. What are you going to say about that? Springfield leader, Springfield, Missouri, December 8th, 1921. Sailing one fine morning through the Arcpotamus archipelago, I saw a strange reddish brown herring man seated on a ledge in a rock. For some minutes, I studied him intently at close range through my telescope. Then he looked up, spotted us, and dived out of sight. The puzzle is not concerned with his identity. He is known to be a mad descendant of a bounty mutineer from Pitcairn Island, but with this mode of progressing from one island to another. For this wild man of the sea has been seen on islands more than 100 miles apart with no landing places between. How then does he reach them? The only solution seems to be that he swims every yard of the distance since he has no boat and shuns all human society. Key point here, going between islands. Remember Rob Alley's book. What did it say? Very comfortable in water. They could swim between islands, not a big deal. This one was a good one. This one was a good one. The Guardian, London, October 21st, 1921. A wild hairy man, footprints on the slopes of Everest. Climbers caught in snow whirlwind. A message from Colonel Howard Bury. On September 22nd, leaving Rayburn at 20,000 20, feet camp. We started off at 4 a.m. according to La Capa, Wendy Passa. After climbing through the icefall, we followed a long and occasional steep ascent with the snow rather soft at the top of the pass. We distinguished here and fox tracks, but one mark, like that of a human foot, was most puzzling. The coolies assured us it was the track of a wild hairy man, and that these men were occasionally to be found in the wildest and most inaccessible mountains. Did you hear that, folks? <laughs> this is another biggie. This is from London. This is a quote coming from the Himalayas, where they're not using the word Yeti, they are using the word wild man. From the top of the pass, there was a wonderful view of Everest, now only a couple of miles away. Immediately opposite was the coal, 24,600 joining Everest at the north peak of the mountain. To reach the coal was the object of the climbers. As from the coal, those appeared to be practi practical, though steep track leading to the summit of the mountain. We found a small sheltered hollow in the snow about 10 feet below the crest of the pass at the height of 22.5. There we pitched camp. During the night, the barometer ascended to minus one Fahrenheit. Everything was frozen solid. Luckily, the sun arrived early in the morning when we gradually thawed out. So even though the majority of that article turns out not to be about Harry Man, they still wrote about it. I thought that was that they use those words, stunning. And again, how much have we been programmed over the last hundred years that, oh no, it's a gorilla, oh no, it's not a hairy man, even though every tribe, every people on every continent, but going back in time, have used the word hairy man. Escanaba, Morning Press, Escanaba, Michigan. Dateline Omaha, a wild giant, eight feet tall with red hair and a foot 14 inches long and six inches wide, has stirred residents of Wheeler County. They know his foot is 14 inches as long because Sheriff E.R. Shaner measured the print. The giant has frightened women, put bloodhounds on his trail, and they refuse to take the scent. A posse of 50 also failed to get him. I found that fascinating. So they put the canines on the scent and they don't want anything to do with it. Hmm. 
Why would that be? But I do find it interesting. I have a few more articles as we step up. We're going forward in time. Feb September 25th, 1924. Ape, ape men, eight feet tall with hairy bodies, like bears seen in Rocky Mountains. Subtitle, Tribe of Ape Indians Reported Found in Pacific Northwest. Several parties leave in search of verification of existence of tribe and wilderness who attacked band of prospectors. This is Wellsboro, Tioga County, the Wellsboro Gazette, September 1924. Kelso, Washington. The tale of tall gorilla men, or as some called them, the ape men, they were credited with having attacked a party of trappers in the mountains here recently. It is a myth, two forest rangers declared. These rangers, J.H. Hoffman and W.M. Welch, who investigated the stories brought back by the trappers, said that the stones that they had reported to have been thrown at the cabin were whole, hurled by human hands. What kind of hands do Bigfoot have? Giddy up! While awaiting reports from parties that have gone to the vicinity of the Spirit Lake on Mount St. Helens in quest of verification of the story told by the trappers that they encountered a band of eight men there, residents were interested in statements attributed to George Tatugi of the Clalem Indian tribe that the eight men are members of a tribe of Indians known as the Silatik tribe. Silatik. This is important, folks. Pay attention. The trappers reported their cabin was bombarded by ape men in the night. Tertagi was quoted as saying that members of the Silotic tribe are huge in stature and hairy like beasts. These Indians, he said, talk the Clalem language and are adept in irritating, adept at ir imitating the sounds of birds. The Silatics were last heard of by the Clallam Indians about 15 years ago, and it was believed by the present Indians that they had become extinct, said Tortugi. The Silatics made their home in the heart of the wilderness on Vancouver Island and on the Olympic Range. The Silatics are seven to eight feet tall with hairy bodies like bears. They are great, great hypnotists and also have a gift of ventriloquism throwing their voices great distances. I remember the first time I read this, and I thought, well, that sounds like garbage. But when you hear it 100 times, 500 times, from credible witnesses, that real sharp no way goes away, and the rounded corner starts to happen, and you start to think, there's something to this. And then, in 1924, would a band of Native Americans come forward and validated this, knowing that they're going to take extreme ridicule? Tortugi declared that his facts have been corroborated by Henry Napoleon, a Clalem tribe, who met one of the Silatic Indians while hunting on Vancouver Island recently, P.J. James, Lumi tribe, and George Hyamas, the Quinault tribe. Although no reports have been received from several parties who left here to search for the Indians, individuals who returned from trips to the cabin of the five pri prospectors confirmed parts of the story of being bombarded in their cabin with rocks from mountain, from mountain devils. Rocks were found inside the cabin. No tracks were discovered. Four new expeditions were outfitted and started today for Spirit Lake, 48 miles from Kelso. One is compromised comprised of four hunters. But why is this important? I think it's interesting that this all happened near Mount St. Helens and that area is essentially evaporated away. Spirit Lake is no longer Spirit Lake as we know it. But, remember we talked about this group of Native Americans, Indians, that supposedly threw rocks at these trappers by Mount St. Helens. 
Another article, same day exactly, trappers tell of attack by eight men. Race of Washington Mountains believe members of Lost Indian Tribe. July 18, 1924, Lansing State Journal. Kelso, Washington. By awaiting reports from parties who have gone to the vicinity of Spirit Lake on Mount St. Helens, in quest of verification of a story told by trappers that they encountered a band of eight men there last week, residents Thursday were interested in statements attributed to Totsky of the Klalem Indian tribe that the eight men are members of the tribe of Silatix. The trappers reported their cabin was bombarded by the eight men during the night. Totsugi was quoted as saying that the members of the tribe are huge in stature and hairy like beasts. These Indians have said they talk the Klalem language and are adept at imitating the sounds of the birds. The Silatics were last heard of by the Klalem Indians about 15 years ago, and it was believed that the present Indians, that they had become extinct. The Silatics made their home in the wilderness on Vancouver Island and the Olympic Range. They are about seven to eight feet tall with hairy bodies like bears. They have a gift of throwing their voices off great distances. Although no reports have been report received from several parties who left here to search for the Indians Monday, individuals who returned Thursday from trips to the cabin of the five prospectors confirmed parts of their story of being bombarded at the cabin with rocks from mountain devils. Rocks were found inside the cabin. No tracks were discovered. So one of those men that was in that cabin that was bombarded in Ape Canyon right near Mount St. Helens, was a man named Fred Beck. Years later, Fred wrote a book, and it's a little tiny thing. It's only about this big. It's about 30 pages long. Um, and he talks in very rough detail about what happened that night. And essentially, they just get, they, they were afraid to leave the cabin, so they stayed till morning. In morning, the subjects that were throwing the rocks and big rocks left. Now, this isn't covered by copyright. No cover of any book is covered by copyright. But Beck did a drawing about what the eight men that came at the cabin looked like. That's what he said. Now, I want you to look at that. Does that look like an ape? No. To me, it looks like almost a Native American man. Doesn't look animalistic at all. So I have a difficult time with people saying, oh yeah, they always have hair on their faces. No, they, these didn't have hair on their faces. And again, the further back you go in time, the more you realize the reality isn't exactly what you may think it is. And what, I'm, what I was doing this whole time, was reading this, just glomming on to anything I could find. Again, Native Americans in 1924 were not looked at, looked at kindly in the world. And to step forward and make the claim they made about the Celtics, that was huge. That was huge. Okay, next one. There's an article in Saga magazine in June 1976. And the title of it was Bigfoot advanced guard from outer space. Subtitle, whenever you find colossal hairy two-legged creatures, you're sure to find UFOs. Well, isn't that interesting? So, I have all these things sitting in the back of my head and wondering, okay, what can I make sense with this? And remember, I had always had an interest in UFOs and I was a MUFON investigator. So I started looking at this. I thought, hmm, could it be? So, let me read you this just one segment. In 67, he had been attached to a military intelligence unit stationed in Southern California. He said his unit had been investigating UFOs for a long time, and then he asked me if I believed in UFOs. I said I had an open mind on the subject, but my club was very interested. Ed emphasized that if I was told emphasized that if I told anyone 
What he was about to say, he would deny having said it. I felt myself getting a little angry, but I said, uh, okay, I'll keep mum about it. Anyway, Ed went on to say that back in 67, he had been called to a remote desert location where a UFO had crashed. Several big trucks went on. Uh, Ed explained that he didn't have bother, he wouldn't have bothered me, but he learned through the newspaper story that I was investigating the McBride report on the blue belted Bigfoot. It was then that he felt compelled to warn me. He said that when his special unit arrived on the crash site, a pungent odor permeated the air. The subject itself, which he said was oblong in shape, was broken into but apparently landed before exploding. Lying around in several places were the bodies of the occupants. He described them as four of the most hideous looking creatures you can imagine. He said they were huge, about nine feet tall, covered with fine hair, and wore a perfect likeness of that described as Bigfoot. The occupants' faces were hairless, mongoloid in appearance with pig-like noses. The mouths, which he said seemed to be grinning in death agony, showed a row of teeth that looked a little like stubby fangs. Now, I read this to you because you can't stay with one source. If you stay with one source, then you get one opinion. As an example, if I watched CNN 24-7, 365 days a year, I'd have one opinion of the world and politics. It would be crystal clear. And just like in the Bigfoot world, if you don't look out for other sources of credible reporting, you're going to miss it. If you only believe people in the Bigfoot world that were from an academic institution, you'd have one opinion. You need to take all of it in. As an example, when I was in Hoopa, I was told of a woman named Lucy Thompson. And Lucy was a Yurok woman, and that's the next tribe over in Hoopa. I met a lot of those Yurok people. And they said, Dave, you gotta read this book called To the American Indian, Reminiscence of a Yurok Woman by Lucy Thompson. This is the book. Lucy married a white man. And Lucy kept extensive notes, not really a manuscript, but it was put together by several people to, to help keep the truthfulness of the Yurok way of life alive. Now, I'm not going to read the whole book or even major portions, but short segments. Chapter 9, The Indian Devil. The Klamath Indians in bringing down their legend from the creation of man until the present day, say that some were made to be good and honorable, some bad and some very real, bad and mean, which they term devils or Omaha. Omaha. Like Omaha the city, but broken up into three segments. We have the conception of the invisible Satan, or wicked old woman, and a real living devil such as walks the earth, and we fear them and they will harm us if they get the opportunity. We've had these living Indian devils, parentheses, living human beings, end of parentheses, all through the long and weary centuries ever since the creation of mankind. Such devils as we find in every race and nation on earth. Our Indian devils, our Indians, for some reason or cause, leave the tribe and go far away into living in the mountains and depths of the forests. Keep in there. When the Indians would go on their hunting and camping trips in the mountain, as soon as they heard an owl screech or hoot, they would stop and listen and try to distinguish if it was an Indian devil imitating the owl or the cry of a wild animal. The Indians would stop at once, kindle a fire, and hallow. This was given as a warning to the devils that they were awake and ready to fight them if necessary. Remember what we were told just a little while ago about the Silatek imitating
We're always afraid of the visible devil, Omaha, that is the living devil here on earth. As we are compelled to guard continually against these monsters and keeping ourselves from being harmed, we are at all times at peace with God. We love him as a great ruler and we are always ready to offer a prayer and worship him. The devil is termed as Kemolan, which means a low, miserable person or animal. And God is in the heavens as invisible, being to living man. He is everywhere and he rules for all. What Lucy was showing here is her Christianity. So there's a sighting in one of the cities just north of Hoopa. And this is like a statement of what happened. The Indian on the north side became afraid and worked his way up the river until he became nearly opposite of Sainak and then swam across the other side again. As he was dodging from tree to tree as the way of these old wild Indians, he came upon a large fir tree. The brother that was in the hollow of the tree made a quick grab and caught him with a firm hold. And as he was wrestling with him, the brother came to his assistance and together they held and tied him fast to the fir tree. Talking about the Indian devil. The Klamath Indians never killed these wild Indians, but in many cases where they had caught them, they almost always found that they were rich by robbing graves of the wealthy. The wild Indians are evidently a former part of our own cast off people and of late years have entirely disappeared and the Indians are wondering what has become of them. Again, this book is called To the American Indian, Lucy Thompson. If you do not read the history of a specific area and you think you're going to learn it by believing what others are telling you, you would be wrong. And this is important. Now, when I was in Hoopa, the natives in the tribe would call Bigfoot Oma, O-H-M-A, Oma. And all of the elders, even the very old ones, called it that. They all prescribed reverence to it. And do you know what other oddity was a consistent pattern in that Hoopa Valley? UFOs. UFOs. From almost the first day I got there, I was told about them. And I, I think people were trying to understand if I was interested in them. But right away, the people knew that there was some connection. I don't think they understood what it might be. But you got to remember that almost every Native American tribe believes they came from the sky people. What does that mean? Well, could be UFOs, could be biblical. I think it depends on each person's view of themselves. Now, every Native American tribe I ever visited believed that Bigfoot Sasquatch was a type of human. But each tribe had a different version on where it lived. Meaning, very few, when you actually asked them, said they lived in caves. That's just ridiculous. Why is it ridiculous? Because if you lived in a cave, there's no way to exit. You got to come out the same way that the bad guys were coming in. So almost every story I hear about caves, I give it zero credibility. Almost, I, I never even remember a, a native saying, yeah, they lived in caves. Nobody believed it, but they lived in this world between different realities. I would hear this all the time. And there were different portals and they came in and out of our dimension at their will. And what caused them or gave them this ability? Nobody really understood, but they did understand that they were real when they were here, they were real, meaning that they left a real footprint, they left real hair, etc. But what gave them that ability 
in the natives' minds to go back and forth. But in the natives' minds also, that was a logical explanation. Because people would always ask, well, why don't we find bodies? And they would say, well, they went home. They went back into their dimension. They were only visiting here. Now, when you hear that coming from multiple tribes, credible people who honestly believe this, why doesn't that make sense? Now, at the time, I had not had an extensive conversation with PhD level physicists. But, I don't mean to keep saying this, but I'm going to, in the making of the special called Vanished for the History Channel, still watch it on Amazon, they sent me up to Wisconsin and I had a, a day with John Brandenburg. John being a theoretical PhD physicist for NASA and teaching up in Wisconsin. John's brilliant. I'm 100% I'm serious. I've, I've talked to a lot of smart people in my life, but he's near the top. He's probably too far advanced for a lot of individuals out there. But in talking to John with 100% certainty, oh, Dave, portals are real. Oh, yeah. And he said that uh, he's part of a group of contract physicists for NASA that get, get together regularly and try to talk through the issues associated with portals and how, how they can be armed, since it is the military part, and can they be manipulated? They're not thinking, are these true? He said, no, no, they're true, Dave. We all know they're true. And then I asked him, how many different dimensions are there? He says, no, that's a good question. He says, I don't know. But there's probably more than a couple. That's what he said. Okay, so now we go back to what the Native Americans said. Well, they never met John Brandenburg. They don't know what theoretical physicists for NASA would say. But yet I'm in the middle of multiple reservations with Harvey. These people all say the very similar things. Hmm. Okay, so now you're at the same place I was at this point in my research. And you've read Rob Alley's book. You've read about the Native American backgrounds. You've read some of the history books. And then you think, and you read these stories about these gigantic footprints that are found. Wow. Like two feet long? Really? And then you see them and... Well, the only time I have ever seen hoaxed footprint material was when I bought Ray Crow's research, which was the track record, the USB that you've seen on these other shows. But when I bought Ray's research, he came in and he goes, hey Dave, have you ever seen something like this? And this is it. So somebody made this giant track with this handle and they could make these giant, <laughs> giant footprint of tracks. Now, I gotta say, you would have to be a pretty big moron to see these, even if they were, you know, right in front of each other, five feet apart. If it was you and me, we couldn't do it five feet apart because how could you jump without making some other mark between it? No, it would have to be a reasonable distance. So you have these fake tracks. Now, why am I showing this to you? Because every fake track would look like the other. Like every left foot track, if you really look closely, would look like the previous and other left foot 
tracks. Right foot tracks. Look at them. Now, if tracks, if the toes move with each track, if there's a different indentation and m manner that the foot twists and turns, now you've got some real tracks. But there are these idiots out there that, that do this. And if you have just a modicum of investigative experience, you'll know when you've seen something that's completely garbage. I've been very lucky, lucky to have been on scene when others just within hours have found tracks. One time somebody tried to hoax me, I never said anything, I just went about my business. Yeah, it's interesting, just walked away from it. But one thing I learned on my own that nobody helped me with was I was up in Hoopa one time and there was a track that I wanted to capture, so I went into a hardware store and I got some plaster of Paris and I came back and it was a wet, rainy, crappy day. And uh, I used the plaster of Paris and it took like nine hours for it to set. And I thought, oh, this is, this is baloney. I'm not doing this again. And everybody does plaster of Paris. So I went to the hardware guy and I said, hey, I need something that sets quick, that's really hard, that will take on the image of what I'm pouring it into. And he goes, Dave, you need resin. He goes, it's a mess. You know, you need a, a plastic bowl to uh, pour the two contents into. You need a wooden spoon to mix it all. And then you pour it into the, the form on the ground. And Dave, within a couple minutes, it's set. Perfect. And he said, oh yeah, it'll be 10 times stronger than plaster repairs. Perfect. <laughs> Along the lines, I learned a lot. That's the only thing I do use. I would never use anything else. And you have to throw away a lot of things. It's expensive to use and you have to throw away the tools essentially when you're in the woods because it's, I don't mean throw it away in the woods. I would never do that, but you have to throw it away. Now, I came across some tracks that were in a very sandy area. And I remember a long time ago, another researcher said, Dave, you married? At the time I said, yeah. He said, uh, go grab your wife's hairspray. I go, what? Yeah, go grab your wife's hairspray when you go out and gonna do some tracks. I go, why is that? He said, because if you're in sand or something and the sand isn't real stiff or formed, you pour the plaster of Paris in and it's just gonna push the sand around. Take real stiff hairspray and spray it all over in the track. Not so much that you're gonna get it to run, but it's gonna be that barrier that makes the track stiff. I thought, that's brilliant. Thank you. And I've always used that, and it's always worked fantastic. So, I'm sure if I was walking down the trail someday and you didn't know me too well, and I opened up my backpack to get out a sandwich or something, and there was a there's a big bottle of hairspray in there. You'd go, oh, that guy's a little weird. <laughs> He's a little weird. <laughs> but, no. But there's your hint for taking tracks. Always, number one, carry a flexible, like, cloth ruler with you. Always. Put, the tr put that ruler alongside the tracks and step back so you can t see the stride and the straight line that the tracks represent. Take as many pictures of those tracks as you can. And if you have nothing else and you're out there, it's always easiest just to put your foot down next to the track, take a picture of your foot in your shoe, and then go home and put a tape measure next to your shoe and show its length. It's the next best thing you can do if you don't have the right stuff. Now, over in Ray Crow's, stuff that I bought. There's some interesting pictures and one of them 
got to remember, this is before digital photography, so people weren't too adept at doing hoaxable type activity. But this photo says, Bigfoot photo, North Santiam River near Mill City, Oregon, July 24th, 91. Alex O'Filer. Let me show it to you. Now, this is kind of what Bigfoot photos are even today. Now, supposedly it's going to be this area right in here where these black objects are at. I personally don't see too much there and not worth a photo, but somebody did. And Ray actually had this on the wall in his research room. So that's one. Number two. Some people like to see things. That, now, there's obviously something there, but there's a Bigfoot between the trees, says Carl Blog, 10 miles northeast of Ukiah, September 77. And he says there's six Bigfoot in this photo. I don't see it, but I'm just showing you what others see. This one. Cinnamon Mountain, Washington. Dropping was tested July of 93. Steve, Steve Williams photo. Now, what you need is you need something next to this to show size. Is this, you know, the size of my finger? Or is this the size of my foot? Remember that. It's another track. Cinnamon Mountain, Washington, July 93. That's a pretty interesting one because if you look up here, there's almost toe definition. If this was a bear, you wouldn't see toe definition. You almost see it. Track. That's almost worth doing a cast on. Now, I have a lot of those pictures. And over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to show you more. But I wanted to give you a wide berth here today. Talk to you about some of the things that help format my mind to where I'm at. And in the future, I'm actually going to talk to you about some of the crazy ideas some people have. And let you come to your own conclusions about what you think this might be. Friends, it is something. It is something because we have DNA evidence of it. It is something because tens of thousands of people in North America have seen it. And it is something because people have claimed a physical response from being around it. Some people have used this word zapped. Some people have used other words. But, yeah, there is a physical effect at times to being around it. So, thanks for being here. That was classroom number five. We're making progress. Now, please tell others if you like this, this class. I'm going to keep giving things to you, keep talking to you about the strange issues that are parallel to Bigfoot that people don't want you to hear and don't want to talk about because it makes them feel uncomfortable. But hang in there. I appreciate you very much being here. Do something nice for somebody today. Polite us out.